Thank you so much, Susan. It's a real pleasure to, to be here uh, with so many friends, old and new. Uh, let, me, let me tell you about it. The Book of Esther stands alone in the Hebrew canon as the only biblical book in which God remains unmentioned. Its record of a redemptive moment that Jews still celebrate joyously as a miraculous event, framed in the guise of a court romance, drawing its sense of realism, at least realpolitik, from a narrative strategy that casts a penetrating eye on episodes of palace intrigue, hushed conversations, secret plots, a sleepless king, a golden scepter, a royal ring and seal, palace chronicles and rescripts sent by couriers throughout a polyglot satrapies of a vast empire, foiling a monstrous genocidal plot blown up from pride and petty jealousies, but exploded by the courage of a lovely queen and her resourceful uncle. If God is active in the events recorded in Esther's scroll, his hand remains unseen. The closest the text comes to mentioning God is in Mordecai's challenge to Esther, sent to her by messenger, when she informed him of the mortal danger she faced, should she approach the king unbidden. Here are her words of her message. Do not imagine, of his message, excuse me. Do not imagine yourself in the palace surviving every other Jew. If you stay silent now, relief and rescue for the Jews will arise elsewhere. But you and your father's house will perish. And who knows if it was not for a time like this that you reached royal rank. Mordecai's tone in that message takes its edge from the gravity of the crisis, but his trust in God's salvation of his people is hedged in reticence. The danger is real and not to be dismissed, despite the hopes that piety musters, and Mordecai does not know what form rescue might take. He pointedly reminds his ward of who she is, lest palace life and seclusion have loosed her loyalties, but he speaks more cautiously of providence, more courtier than theologian. He makes doubt the ally of his argument. Who knows if it was not for just such a moment as this that you, of all the women in the empire, were made the consort of the king. Lots then, in effect, were cast twice. First, overtly in the choosing of a day on which the Jews of every province were to die, but more hiddenly in Esther's choice as queen. Facing her moment, Esther asks that her people fast for her, a solemnity still observed today she and her maidens will fast as well. Then she will approach the king, despite the dictates of law, custom, and prudence. And she says, if I perish, I perish. She does not know Mordecai's, she does not echo Mordecai's bluff assurance that somehow God will act. But she makes her choice, not knowing whether she will be God's instrument or just another victim in the maw of injustice. She chooses not in assurance, but in uncertainty. Punning in Hebrew on Esther's Persian name, which was in fact an eponym of the goddess Astarte, just as her uncle's was of the god Marduk, the Talmudic rabbis saw hints of God's hiddenness, haster astir panai, I shall surely conceal my face, as the Babylonian Talmud puts it, quoting from the book of Deuteronomy. The loss of intimacy with God can be read as a scar of the spiritual exile that Moses warns of as he warms to his cautionary final song to Israel. But it is also part of the human condition. As Roger Scruton writes, drawing on thoughts of Simone Weil, God can show himself in this world only by entirely withdrawing from it. To appear among us clothed in the divine attributes would be to absorb and annihilate what is not God and so to undo the work of creation. 
Thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. Isaiah takes up God's hiddenness when he pictures potentates from several nations saying, Indeed, you are a God that hides yourself. But almost in the same breath, he acknowledges God as the sole true divinity. And those potentates are heard in his imagination to acknowledge the same God. There is no other. Ibn Ezra, the great medieval commentator, 1093 to 1167, parses that double-edged thought. God was hidden, yet active in saving Israel. Quoting Ibn Ezra, as the commentators say, although invisible, God showed himself for Israel's sake. Esther and Mordecai live and act in that unknowing. Like them, we do not know when or how God will act. Unlike them, we often fail to notice just when he has acted to save our lives or intervene in our lives. So the book of Esther is keenly relevant for us. Esther and Mordecai are not marionettes. Their acts and choices are their own. That is part of what it means to say that God created heaven and earth and all living creatures. God gives more than bare existence, as if anything could be merely bare existence with no character or nature of its own, no dispositions or capacities to act, or in the human case, the power to choose and plot a course. Esther, in her crisis, faced a choice momentous in its outcome. So in his own way did Mordecai. He needed to think through the options open to him and shoulder the risks that others might have disowned. The choices Esther and Mordecai would, have, would make have a lasting impact, not only on their people, but on the choosers themselves. They were making decisions about who they would be. Esther, above all, at her critical moment, became the person of her choice. But her situation, made prominent by the outcomes of that choice, is a paradigm of human choices, even those too close, familiar, or routine, too small to dominate awareness for most of us most of the time, even in our own case, let alone in that of others, whose acts we may incline to treat as the effects of external causes and not of choices at all. God set the stage here, just as Mordecai proposed on seeing an opportunity for Esther in the midst of danger. But the choice she made was hers. It's natural enough to think of divine action as intervention. So when the reporters show up in the wake of a tornado and press a microphone into the face of someone whose home was spared and drop the formulaic gambit, well, what did it feel like when you saw your neighbor's home swept away by the storm wind and yours was barely touched? We're ready for the formulaic answer. Well, I guess somebody up there was watching out for us. How many times have you heard that one? But how reflective is that? Was God ignoring the neighbors? Didn't he make them too? And if God made all things, didn't he also make the storm and the earthquake? and the tsunami? Is God active only when crisis touches us and prayed to or thanked only by asking for nature to shift from its familiar course? That kind of expectation is not just unreasonable. It's self-serving and corrupt. It is unjust to others and it does no good to God. In the book of Job, we overhear God speaking from the storm wind not in the still small voice he used in speaking to Elijah, but one still needs to know how to listen. The storm wind is not typically an instrument of judgment. It cannot discriminate, as God's judgment should. In Noah's flood, God is pictured as exercising moral judgment, but then as giving nature his covenant. Seed time at harvest will endure. God will no longer interfere. He already knows man's bent that human beings incline to evil from their youth. If we want to fathom what is distinctively Jewish in Jewish philosophy, we get a hint from Mordecai's reticence as pictured in the first book our, pictures, our scriptures call, in the first book in which our scriptures call an individual a Jew, a book written 
in the narrative manner of Herodotus, distinctive philosophically beyond the Jewish reticences speaking of God's actions in our lives is that we do not set human freedom against nature, but see human powers of choice in Maimonidean terms as part of nature, just as we do not oppose nature and convention, but see art and artifact and even artifice as parts of nature, not alien to it. In the same way, we do not play off nature against divinity in a zero-sum explanatory game, as though explaining an event naturalistically somehow excluded divine action, so that the more we understand scientifically, the less room we leave for God. On the contrary, the better we understand nature's workings, including those of the human mind and soul, the abler we are to see and celebrate God's work. If we see God's work everywhere, as Maimonides says, a true monotheist will, and regard nature as an expression of God's wisdom and nature's bounty as a gift of God's grace, we gain a sense of miracles everywhere. Thus, in an ancient prayer still recited today, protesting our inability to thank God adequately for one thousandth of the millions upon millions of favors, each drop of rain is numbered among the favors for which God deserves our gratitude. Clearly, rain can be a blessing. But like any natural occurrence, it can also be a trial. Yet, a trial can be made a blessing in much the way that a poet or any creative artist or artisan or inventor makes an opportunity of a difficulty. So Abraham is blessed when he sur surmounts his trial by the commandment to offer up Isaac, his long-awaited son, his crisis leads to his discovery of the unity of holiness with love and the incompatibility of holiness with violence and violation. The god of monotheism is not the mysterious mysterium tremendum of Rudolf Otto that beckons wantonly to pagan piety. It is through that discovery that I, Abraham, becomes a blessing to all the nations of the earth. Esther, too, faces a test not of faith, in what might seem the familiar sense. Her trust is not that God will reach out and catch her if she falls. Her courage comes in her acceptance of the truth that she might die. Her faith arises in the unconditioned commitment she makes to God's truth by choosing the nobler act. God set the conditions, but it was she who rose to the test, summoning her people to fast with her, to ensure them to be with her, and not holding back to be worthy of her potential sacrifice. God acted here, but not by disrupting the course of nature, even in less momentous trials that we may pass through, where the trials are almost unnoticed. It is we, not God, who is tested, and we who need the test if we are to become the human beings we are capable of becoming. To think of miracles as exceptions to nature's, nature's steady course, one must have some core idea of nature. So it's strange to find Leo Strauss arguing, and I quote his words, the Old Testament whose basic premise may be said to be implicit rejection of philosophy does not know nature. The Hebrew term for nature is unknown to the Hebrew Bible. I find it amusing. Uh, there's a two quote way in there, isn't it? The course of the term philosophy is also unknown to the Hebrew Bible. Uh, yet, as Nachmanides remarks, Nachmanides 1195 to 1270, Nachmanides remarked, a cow would not notice a miracle. The word Strauss finds missing in the Hebrew canon is the medieval term for nature, which is teva, based on the Arabic term tabia a term widely attested among medieval philosophers who wrote in Arabic and the translators of the Greek texts into Arabic. The base meaning of that root is to sink, as in the Song of Moses, where Pharaoh's hosts are sunk in the sea of reeds like a stone amid the mighty waters, or the stone that was sunk into Goliath's forehead. So the term was a natural choice in medieval philosophy, suggesting the impress of a stamp or an intaglio, making, a point, making a, an impression. As the biblical word 
for a signet ring would suggest tabia, tabat in Hebrew. Indeed, the root acquires overtones of the idea of nature when Proverbs speaks of the mountains sunk as piers anchoring the earth. In the Psalms, those footings assure nature's stability. He anchored the earth on its footings, never to totter. Perhaps Leo Strauss missed that reference to nature because he presumed that nature must be set apart from it at odds with any thought of God's commitment to it. The Torah, in fact, does not use the root tet beis ayin to signify nature. It has other words to do that job. One of them is yetzer, the word that I translated bent a little while ago, meaning one's inclination. As, God's, as in God's saying, the bent of a man's heart is evil from its, his youth. Here, nature has its familiar dynamic and local sense, the growing, changing character of a thing or person, rather than pointing to the constancy of the cosmos. But the Torah broaches its idea of nature by contrasting God's handiwork with the primordial tohu vavohu and references of Genesis to the sprouting of herbage, the seed-bearing plants yielding fruit of their own kind, the sun and moon presiding over day and night, the living creatures reaching for transcendence by the avenue open to them, striving to be fruitful and multiply. The Torah's interest is in God's creation of these beings. As it says in Nehemiah, you are the Lord, you alone, you made the sky and the sky beyond the sky and all their host, the earth and all that is upon it, the seas and all that they contain, you give them life, life to them all, and all the host of heaven bow down before you. And God gives more than life alone. He also imparts the power of living things to perpetuate their kind, a blessing expressed directly in the human case, since the human couple receive not just the breath of life, but also articulate speech. And it says in the Talmud, what a wonderful thing it is, not only that God created man in his own image, but also inform him of the fact. Creation, biblically, is the act and work of God, but vitality, procreation, and human thought and speech are gifts freely bestowed, not clutched possessively unborn to God's bosom. In recognizing the diverse and fecund, swarming, flying, swimming, creeping creatures, scripture defines nature ostensibly and vividly by reference to all God's creatures and the dynamic thrust of their claims upon being. So nature is present in the Torah as a backdrop to its history and anchor of its argument for God's role as creator. But since the Torah does not alienate God from the product of his work when it speaks of miracles, God is typically said to act by way of his creations. Pharaoh and his people are already are afflicted by lice, and boils, frogs, and darkness, swarming creatures, cattle plagues, locusts, and hail. The first and last of the plagues, the bloody waters and the slaying of the firstborn, have their impact, if not their origins, on the natures they affect. Only at the outset does God create from nothing. Israel, trapped with their backs to the sea, crossed dry shot when the Lord drove back the sea with a strong east wind all that night. The marvelous paradigm that's already been mentioned in this conference. Pharaoh pursues his departing slaves after a natural change of heart. God shields Israel behind a dark cloud. And when they reach the far shore, the sea returned to its steady flow, etano, its regular course, another biblical term for nature, found in the Psalms. Once again, you want to check Psalm 74, verse 15. It is the returning waters that allow the song to say that God cast Pharaoh's chariot tree and his host into the sea. The implements of the miraculous events are all of them natural. In the book of Job, as Saja, Saja is the first systematic Jewish philosopher, died in 942. As Saja explains, nature is the theme of God's speech from the storm wind. Again, we hear of God's laying the foundations of the earth. But the imagery of sound design is pursued in the allusions to the earth's measure and cornerstone. God set limits to the reach of the waves. 
The snow and hail, torrents and thunderstorms, sprouting grass, frost, rain and ice, all serve at his command. God, not man, reigns in the Pleiades or looses Orion. The rains fall on wastelands, for man is not the be-all and end-all of creation. God gives us reason, but also provides prey for the lion and food for the raven's young. He knows the seasons of birth and gestation for deer and mountain goats. He gives the onager his freedom. For a wild ass would only laugh at the city throngs. You picture a wild ass walking through Carfax. The wild ox would hardly lodge at some farmer's crib or calmly plow his furrow or gather seed corn from the threshing floor. Nature here is wild and free, overseen by God, whose mercies are on all his works, as it says in Psalm 145. The greatest land or water creatures are scarcely playthings to God, as we read in the 40th and 41st chapters of the book of Job. It's Hume who has a weak idea of nature. His dogmatic empiricism undermines the idea of an inner regularity in things, leaving him no better case against miracles than his finding them unusual. A little divine intervention there. Um, leaving him, no, let, me, let me not, uh, uh, let, let you not overlook that ad hominem there. Uh, no better, no better case against miracles than he makes against the possibility that a black man might be talented. Oh, I've never seen such a thing. And of course, when Hume was even told of such a person, he refused to acknowledge and admit it. That kind of dogmatic empiricism does not serve well. One needs to have a definite idea of nature, even to know what a miracle might be. Biblically, there's bound to be a tension between talk of miracles and thoughts of nature, with God as its guarantor. The rabbis seek to ease this tension by having the prominent exceptions to nature's regularity woven into its fabric from the start. Now here's a passage from the Talmud. Ten things were created on the Sabbath eve at twilight. The mouth of the earth that swallowed Korach and his cohort. The mouth of the well, which was the legendary well that was supposed to have followed Israel through the Sinai Desert for 40 years. The mouth of the she-ass, that's Bilam's ass, Balaam, if you like, that rebuked the would-be prophet. The rainbow, sign of God's covenant. The manna that nourished Israel through the desert and was never too much or too little uh, when it was, when they, those who took more wound up with no excess and those who took too little wound up with no deficiency. They got a double portion on the Friday so that they wouldn't have to collect it on the Sabbath. And that was the one time when the extra didn't spoil. The rod of Moses with which he performed his portents. The Shamir, that's the legendary worm that cleaved the stones of the temple in Jerusalem without uh, the use of an iron tool with, which might be associated with bloodshed. The letters, writing, and tablets of the Decalogue. Some say, the Talmud adds, imps as well, and the grave of Moses, which God prepared and no one knows its location, lest there be some cult about it. And some say, the tongs made with tongs, and the ram, I almost lift out the ram, the ram that was substituted for Isaac and Mount Moriah. The first tongs, mentioned almost as if in an afterthought, are emblematic of the difficulties inherent in the emergence of higher from simpler things, the seeming paradox of tongs made without tongs to handle them at the forge, raises the question of the primacy of potency to act, or of act to potency, as we would put it in Aristotelian terms, does the idea of evolution obviate or implicate the idea that since nothing comes from nothing, the greater cannot emerge from the less? Theism, along with Plato's kindred thesis as to the primacy of the absolute over relative value, and thus the possibility of emanation as well as creation, all depend on a coherent answer to that question, question typified by the rabbis in their symbolic language as tongs made with tongs. The writing and the words and the letters of the Decalogue 
and the substance of the tablets on which a supernal god might transcribe and inscribe his teachings, raise questions of causal and ontic primacy and of God's role and active role in creation. Aristotle addresses another special case when he speaks of the role of the active intellect in human thought. Here's a passage from the Eudemian Ethics. One does not decide to decide, which would presuppose some prior decision. There must be a starting point, nor does one think after first thinking that one must think, and so ad infinitum. So thought does not originate from thinking, nor a decision from a prior decision. What then could be the starting point but chance? So everything would start from chance? But perhaps there is a starting point with none before it that, that can act just by being what it is. That is what we are looking for, the origin of movement in the soul. The answer then is clear. In the soul, as in the universe, all is moved by God. For in a way, the divine within us is what moves everything. Reasoning begins not from reasoning, but from something greater. And what could be greater than mind and knowing but God? That's the end of the Aristotle passage. Here, too, we confront the priority of the infinite to the finite and the mystery about the nexus of the transcendent to the here and now in ourselves or in the cosmos. These are questions to which, to which we must return if we hope to wrestle with what it means to speak of God's act in nature. But first we should consider the other things created in the twilight of the sixth day. Evidently, the twilight creations of the Midrash did not spring from nature's familiar order, yet neither did they breach God's plan. All ten served the welfare and mission of Israel. Built into nature's fabric, they underscore the subtext of numerous liturgical blessings in which Israelites acknowledge God's grace in sanctifying us with his commandments, a subtext that unifies hubris with humility in the thought that the Torah reveals concretely what the supernal wills for us. What is whispered in the homily of the sages as to the ten marvels created in the twilight of the sixth day is the understanding that Israel's destiny is woven into the fabric of being. The warp of history is given by the unfolding of natural events, but the weft is added. Both the rare threads lit up by their moment and those that seem more drably colored represent our acts and our choices. Unlike the threads spun and cut by Hesiod's fates, these do not preempt our opportunities to act and choose. Hence the irony implicit in Esther's scroll. Haman's plots fill out as they would, but history reversed his plans. The outcome arose not simply from God's judgment, but from Esther's choice. Plato similarly gives choice its say, putting into the mouth of Lachesis, the daughter of necessity, the speech that countermands her ancient fatalistic role. Here's Plato in the 10th book of the Republic. No divinity shall cast lots for you, but you shall choose your own deity. Let him who, to whom falls the first lot select a life to which he must cleave. But virtue has no master over her, and each shall have more or less of her as he honors or despites her. The, the blame is his who chooses. God is blameless. Like Plato, Maimonides holds God above reproach. Like Heraclitus, he finds the key to destiny in our characters, not our stars. His God, like Plato's, is above change as well as above reproach. Reading the list of things created in the twilight of the sixth day, Maimonides says of the sages, they did not believe God changes his mind. At the outset of creation, he set into nature those things by which all would be done that would be done. God used and augmented, that's the end of my Monday's quote, God used and augmented the natural powers of things. And again, my Maimonides, outcomes that were frequent were natural. Those that were extraordinary, reserved for a remote future, were marvels. But all were alike. What does he mean by that? All expressed the natures that God had imparted. Maimonides, as Tzvi Langerman observes, outdoes the ancient rabbis in naturalizing miracles, weaving yet more tightly into nature's fabric those scriptural marvels not listed as created in the twilight of this first Sabbath. 
that the waters would part for Israel at the sea, or for, Josh, or for Joshua at the Jordan, was set into the nature of water at the creation of that element. Likewise, the natures made possible, that made possible the miracles of Elijah and Elisha, the halting of the sun and the moon for Joshua at Gibeon, and every other scriptural miracle beyond those the sages counted. The occasionalists of the Quran, Muslim theologians of the early ages, ninth, eighth, ninth centuries, resorted to a different strategy. Rather than naturalized miracles, they made every event an act of God, arguing that no determinate reality can do or be more than God pleases. None can outlast its instant or exceed its place. Beings other than God were atoms. Each had a position, but no lasting duration, no size, in fact, and no causal power. For all power, they said, quoting the Quran, all power belongs to God. The notion of dimensionless atoms had already been pilloried by Avicenna for the ge geometrical paradoxes it entrained, and even earlier by al ashari himself a practitioner of Kalam, who had seen the difficulties for perceptual realism entailed by a denial of natural causality. Those had already happened when Maimonides sharply criticized the occasionalists for erasing the very idea of nature and undermining God's role as creator of a coherent co cosmos. Why, he asked, would God create things that no one needs if, say, food sustains us and medicines cannot treat our illnesses, why would there be such a thing as medicines? He was a practitioner of medicine, as you know. Nature, he maintained, is subtler and more ramified than the occasionalists allowed. By God's providence, it affords us resources in proportion to the urgency of our need. Air most plentifully, then water, then simple wholesome foods. Nature provides mother's milk for babes until they're ready for other nutriments, not in spite of God, but by his grace. God, through nature, lets some life forms depend on others, as all animals ultimately depend on plants. God uses natural things to implement his will. So the psalmist can refer sweepingly to all four elements, wind and fire, earth and sea, as God's instrumentalities. That's in the 104th Psalm, quoted by Maimonides at Guide to the Perplexed, part two, chapter six. God loses nothing by empowering natural things, and it does not diminish his sway to delegate to us the powers of free choice. Langerman finds Maimonides growing more accepting of miracles in his later works, less confident of the natural sciences, and more inclined to theistic voluntarism. Yet at no time, he stresses, did Maimonides surrender his belief in nature's causal continuity. From his youth, Langerman writes, the regularity of natural events was for him the greatest proof of God's reality and rule. Still, God's covenant found confirmation not in miracles, but in its content, as Deuteronomy demands. Indeed, Maimonides found the broadest appeal for loyalty to that covenant, as he states in writing to the beleaguered Jews of Yemen in his time, neither in the natural order nor in miracles like the crossing of the Red Sea or the Sea of Reeds, as we could properly call it, but in the giving of the law at Sinai. The burden of that theophany was normative, and its bestowal, as Maimonides saw it, did not disrupt the laws of nature, but touched the minds of an entire nation. God reached out to them, and they responded by reaching up toward him, insofar as each was able. That thought captures a second strategy of Maimonides for naturalizing miracles, perhaps more welcome than the midrashic twilight moment to those of us who share Maimonides' belief that causal regularity is the surest sign of God's rule. All the movements of Balaam's ass, he now argues, were brought about by an angel. But in the voluntaristic version of Neoplatonism that he invokes, angels are the forms and forces God imparts in allowing things to act. Angels, then, are what the Greek philosophers would call the natures of things. But later in the guide, Maimonides says that Balaam's conversation with his she-ass should be set into the context of a prophetic vision so was Jacob's portentous wrestling with the angel and Joshua's encounter with an angel. Generalizing, he writes, do not imagine for a moment that an angel can be seen or heard to speak except in dreams or visions of prophecy, as the principle is clearly stated in the book of Numbers. 
In a vision do I make myself known to him. In a dream do I speak to him. Even as he presses the generality of that idea, Maimonides stresses the reality of angels as God's intermediaries in nature. Subjectivity here does not entail unreality. To Maimonides, the intellectual realm is the meeting place of the finite with the infinite. The domain through which God governs nature is also the station of the enlightened or inspired mind. So, bracketing the miraculous within the realm of personal experience need not mean its dismissal, and the experience, as Sinai reveals, need not be private. Bible scholars tell us that poetry, like the Song at the Sea in Exodus, antedates the prose passages in which it is embedded. The later narratives situate the ancient poetic responses to a living experience. Hence, the opening word, the Hebrew word is az, then. The opening word of the verse introducing Moses' song at the sea. Then it was that Moses and the children of Israel sang this song to the Lord. And you can see there that the song is being set into the prose narrative, which is to explain its situation. God's fighting for the Israelites, so recently slaves, whose children were cast into the Nile and whose taskmasters expected to beat them with impunity, belongs to their experience. As the tide turned, Egypt's chariotry sank like a stone, like lead in the mighty waters. The sea had seemed to part, its waters to stand up like walls as Israel passed dry shot across the seabed. No Israelite heard the foe promising themselves booty, but the Israelites, singing joyously, could almost taste the irony of Egypt's defeat as God's breath sent back the sea cover. Pharaoh's forces were drowned. The experience was shared, not in Hume's tendentious sense, nor in the naive and equally tendentious thaumaturgic sense that Hume combats, but as a collective epiphany captured in the poet's words, just as Deborah's song seizes its moment, picturing Sisera's mother at her lattice work, reassured by her tactful ladies that only the rich booty of the conquest can have detained the brigands' chariots, and the perspective shifts from the quiet doubt, from quiet doubt and uneasy reassurance among the ladies awaiting the return of their troops with the ravished Israelite women to Israel's realization that suddenly the roads are now safe and the prose historian's verdict and the land had peace for 40 years. A shared moment is captured once again in the poet's vision when Joshua orders sun and moon to halt while he completes his enemy's route. The poet's words preserved and quoted from the vanished book of Yashar, the stars did not literally battle Sisera, but the triumph was no less real for that, and no less real in Jerusalem when the Six-Day War, no less real at Entebbe in the year of the American Bicentennial. Each generation has its triumphs and visions, and if the cause is just, there's no blasphemy in seeing the work and hand of God in it. The clearest case of a shared theophany in Israel's history was what the sages called Mahmoud Sinai, the moment when all Israel stood before God at Sinai, and each, according to his or her capacity, experienced God's presence, not as a mysterious and tremendum, but as a commanding reality, inviting each one to rise in emulation to God's holiness or transcendence by following the law that articulates our means of doing so. That revelatory moment was no merely ineffable ecstasy, but the gateway to a way of life. Midrashically, we're told, that every future generation was present at Sinai, and every subsequent generation relives it ritually in the congregation, when the congregation rises to hear the Decalogue read once again from the scrolls of the law. It is, it is natural, not least in times of crisis or hardship, for outstanding characters to be adorned in popular imagination or sacred history with tales of marvels like those that decorate the memory of Elisha or Elijah or the latest Wunder Rebbe and expectations of the sort that gave charisma its glow or glister before our journalism turned it into a commodity. Real greatness needs little tinsel, so little of it clings to the characters of a Lincoln or a Gandhi. The church can routinize the marble by requiring documented miracles of its saints, an expectation that St. Anselm tried to duck 
as we can read in Southern's wonderful biography of Anselm. His focus, as we know, was more on the epiphany than on the laying on of hands. For us, too, the epiphanies that matter most are experiential, but also shared. The miracles biblically ascribed to Moses relate more to his people than to his person, and thus to Israel's sense of providence and of chosenness for a mission. Even the heaviest midrashic embellishment cannot overwrite the givenness of events or disable within, with credulity or incredulity the meanings we naturally seek and find in their patterns. Even the pronouncement that life and history are absurd is an excrescence of our penchant to connect the dots in search of meanings. Nor can one successfully pretend that any construction or construal is as good as any other, as though life itself were Wittgenstein's duck rabbit, whose ambiguity is its message. Natural messages, natural miracles, are distinguished less by their rarity than by our apprehension. Yet events can have a significance that is real. Most tellingly, the very existence and dynamic of beings, as I've argued through the years, sets us a real value before us. The fact of life, or still more basically, the existence of anything at all, rather than nothing, are examples of such things that I'm most ready to call a miracle. Not for the rarity of such realities, but for their marvel. Scientists, as well as poets, see all these things, and moderns see nothing different from what the ancients saw. Although scientists today may be as reticent as Mordechai in speaking of them. The rainbow is a sign, not in spite of optics, but for its beauty. One party or another may seek to make its meaning their own, but that can't make one construal no better than another. In Israel's case, the memory of Egypt is made a moral imperative from God's mouth to love the stranger, remembering that we were strangers in Egypt. That memory, too, so construed, defines a sense of destiny actively chosen rather than taken passively, like the Geworfenheit of Heidegger, the Nazi apologist. Its moral truth stands alongside its historical verisimilitude to confirm it. Vengeance might have been the message taken, but that was rejected. If Israel has been the suffering servant, as Isaiah saw her, there is no less truth in her glimpses of herself in memory as God's once youthful bride and lover, sometimes bereft, but never divorced, never forsaken. The prophets of Israel seeing God's hand in her sufferings can honestly claim a license to see God's hand as well in her moments of triumph. There's both power and weakness in construing all that occurs as meaningful for oneself or one's people. What draws the line is partly the moral use made of our construals and partly our command of science, general and human. Hentred's last illusion in the mayor of Casterbridge is his conviction that fate has conspired against him. There's a similar mingling of self-pity and self-congratulation in the existentialist's idea of life's absurdity and its mirror image in their notion that one's warm embrace of any choice could make it right. Much like the moral solipsism of the egoist who casts himself as the hero of the piece and takes every person, thing, or event he meets as mere stage business props and settings devised to show off his own acts and passions. Knowing one's place in nature is the start of real wisdom, pointed to in the Delphic admonition to self-knowledge. As it stood before, Plato turned it inside out by portraying Socrates as finding in it a hidden hint of the divinity of the self. The ancient maxim was a counsel of piety. Know thyself, that is, know that you're not divine. So it links hands with the admonition of the Psalms. Piety is the start of wisdom. Piety advises modesty, and modesty knows that others too have needs and an agenda, that they as well as we live in a natural world where all things exercise a conatus that may affect or concern us, but hardly turns exclusively to serve or thwart our own interests. Plato was right, of course, up to a point. There is a bit of divinity in us, breathed into us, as the Torah would have it, with life and self-consciousness. That's why Mordecai and Esther were able to hear and listen to and act on what the small, still, still small voice was telling them. Piety is not reticence and restraint. Mordecai might have 
told himself or convinced himself that nothing could be done, that speaking out would only make things worse. Isaiah Berlin, a brilliant man of this institution and a great teacher of mine, chose silence as he confessed to Michael Ignatieff when his British masters held him back. So did many others choose close to the levers of power at the court of Ahasuerus of our time, FDR. Not so were Jan Karski, Raphael Lemkin, or with a happier uh, outcome, Natan Sharansky, Avi Weiss, when their words and actions reached the ear of Scoop Jackson, let's say, and other senators in behalf of Russian Jewry and Avi Weiss's case, to save so many people from the Soviet maw, or Theodor Herzl. It did not take preternatural powers for Herzl to foresee the tragic denouement for European Jewry. Only intellectual courage and honesty, a refusal to hide from the fact or from his own flesh. Lemkin documented the genocidal aims of the Nazi legislation while it was in effect, before it had taken full effect, before the full weight of it was born. He did not live long enough to see the, the full outcome of his work nor did Herzl live long enough to see the birth of the State of Israel, but he saw its necessity. Avi Weiss, who is still living, speaking out again in behalf of truth and justice as he sees them as best he can, did not, he did leave, live to see the fall of the Soviet Empire, which was indeed an evil empire as its former denizens well recognized today and are at liberty to say. He didn't live long enough to see the publication of his autobiography. Returning as promised to the questions of the primacy of the actual and the precedence of the infinite from which the finite springs, emergence is the theme on which I'd like to close, a cosmic rather than a local truth, for part of what makes one reading of events more credible and even saner than another is its ability to fit together the varied facets of experience into a coherent whole. That is the standard science uses and it is the standard theists should use and can use when they speak about God's governance or about creation, not reserving separate epistemologies for one day of the week. Natural miracles like the rainbow are not alien to the work of science. I can focus on two special cases of emergence here, one sheathed, sheathed within the other, the work of evolution and the rise of souls and minds in living beings. I won't expatiate on those themes since I've written a book on one and co-authored another on the second. But I do want to say that I think it's misguided to choose or try to choose between a top-down and a bottom-up approach in either of those domains, evolution and the emergence of the soul. That is, I think evolution no more precludes theism than theism precludes evolution. Evolution is evidence for theism given the localization of value inextricably in the history of every living species. And the emergence of mind and soul from its biological roots is evidence for not arrival to the reality of God's work in nature. For there is a directionality to evolution in the groping, as Teilhard de Chardin called it, of the lineages of life toward light, that is, toward autonomy and self-direction. That directionality points toward God. We can see the link whether we look upward from our lab benches or writing desks or vault upwards as the prophets strive to do and try to see things from God's universal standpoint. In Maimonidean terms, as I've intimated, the human rational soul is the meeting place of finitude with the infinite. We can see that pretty clearly if we ask ourselves about the human capacity to conceive infinity, to conceive and not imagine. Extrapolating from an illustration Descartes used to make clear the difference between conception and imagination, his pointing out that we readily conceive the difference between a Kyliagon and a Myriagon, a figure with a thousand sides and a figure with 10,000 sides, but the imagination simply blurs the two. We can say that we readily conceive a circle, although we may have trouble imagining a perfect one. A circle is from one standpoint a polygon with infinite sides and ankles. To say so is perhaps just the opposite of trying to square the circle, for it acknowledges and accepts rather than seek to overcome 
at least one fact about the infinite. Mathematicians, as we know, routinely work today with quantities, of, with quantities thought of as extended to infinity. And a keen and creative mathematician like Georg Cantor conceptualized diverse orders of infinity whose quantitative relations are demonstrable. To reach for God's infinity conceptually is more demanding, of course, since we must guard against tainting our ideas of perfection with any tincture of our own human limitations. If we ask ourselves the ancient question about the matter on which God's teachings were written or might be written, it's pretty clear today that this would be the human brain, the organ of the soul, a product of evolution, but open to new experience and capable of creativity as well as caring. Each human brain can build as many synaptic connections as there are elementary particles in the universe. How a brain could arise from simpler matter and how consciousness, memory, agency, perception, and creativity could emerge from the brains of persons are questions that our sciences can address in ways both promising and fruitful. But the risk is always present when we hear or tell such stories that reductionism will erase what they seem to explain. That was not an error Darwin made. He did not, in discovering how one species arose from another or how human beings arose from other primates, erase the explanandum or its differentiae, leaving explanation with nothing to explain. The mind, we say, is made possible by the brain. That much was made known as early as Galen, although we know much more about the detail of how it works today. But what we need to keep ever present in our minds is that the mind is not the brain any more than human beings are apes or apes are chemicals. Consciousness makes us subjects, not mere objects, with all the moral, aesthetic, and spiritual implications of that fact. Spirit is part of that story, the human story, whether it shapes itself into a quest for God or pursues artistic or scientific purposes or simply struggles to stay alive and preserve one's loved ones or humanity or nature. Our intellectual nature is our guardian angel here. Analysis will break things down conceptually, but it need not destroy them. Synthesis may relate things to one another and see a larger whole. So long as reduction has not denatured our understanding, we will recognize an up and down to things. Knowing up from down can always orient us towards God's work in nature if we allow ourselves to look. The upward path will face us toward the divine, whose work is visible all around us. One does not simply respond to a paper of such scope and breadth, and so I will limit myself to a few remarks on memory, meaning, miracle, and wonder. There's a poignancy in the story of Esther that Len has brought out beautifully, and that is something that is a common human possession. I'm reminded of one of J.R.R. Tolkien's letters to one of his sons, in which he says, and I'll have to paraphrase here, I apologize, surely there was an Eden on this unhappy earth. We all sense it. We're constantly longing for it. Our whole nature at its best and least corrupted, its gentlest and most humane, is soaked with the sense of exile. And so we look around and we try to make sense of things and we try to see meanings in things that may be meanings beyond those that we give to them. There's such a wealth of material that in the uh, Old Testament that even Len was not able to exhaust it all. I was reminded as he was speaking of the story of Joseph. And of course, when Joseph's brothers come down to Egypt and he makes himself known to them, he says, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. And I think part of what Len's been trying to say is that we can see things precisely because we are conscious and we're able to interpret. We can see things at levels of pattern that maybe we can only glimpse, but that suggest to us that there are meanings and orders in some of these affairs that are not of our making. And that is important. I'll push back at one point 
with respect to the question of Hume and the thaumaturgical uh, position that he was opposing, I certainly agree that it is possible and all too prevalent for us to adopt what Rudyard Kipling satirizes in his poem, Natural Theology, the theology that comes to us naturally, why God is an oriental potentate. He is to be propitiated. We are to give him a certain amount of coin and a certain amount of prayer, and in return, he is to shower us with benefits, or to use a more modern image, God's a vending machine. We insert the appropriate coinage, we press the appropriate buttons, and God must respond to us in the way that we demand. And if he doesn't, we have a grievance. But I'm also reminded of John Updike's seven stanzas on the resurrection, seven stanzas at Easter, where he warns us that we must not cease to make miracle less monstrous for our own convenience, lest in some unthinkable hour, we should find ourselves embarrassed by the miracle and crushed with remonstrance. There is a tension there, uh, a tension in the meaning of miracle and in the very notion of petitionary prayer. In the New Testament, we find two models of petitionary prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. We ask for specific things, and we are to ask in trust. And at the same time, nevertheless, not my will, but thine. That tension is a tension that, again, we can find moving back into the Old Testament. At the Battle of Dunkirk, when things were darkest, the English forces sent a three-word message. And if not... It was, of course, a reference to the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who said, our God is able to deliver us. And if not, not if he is not able, but if he does not so choose, well, still we will serve him. One image that cropped up a couple of times in Len's paper was the image of the ass or the cow who wouldn't recognize a miracle. And I... I was forcibly reminded of a poem that one of my friends wrote, and I'm embarrassed to say that I hadn't any access to it, and I can't even at the moment remember his name. I think it's Brendan. But uh, I, I'm going to do my best to paraphrase it, so if there's something wrong with it, this is my fault. Go look up the original. It's very good. But here's, here's how I recall it's going as best I can recall it, recall it. And it does remind me of, and should be put in the context, of Psalm 19, which says that the heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament shows his handiwork. So here's the poem. An ass looked up to heaven. Stars were there. They sparkled bright above the cloudy pass. And never diamond, ruby, sapphire shone so fair as half the light one single star on high could share. He brayed dismissal turning back to lowly grass. And ass, who sees the heavens, sees them as an ass. Thank you so much for these fabulous papers. And first off, uh, Lynn, do you want to respond uh, to anything that Tim okay. said? Possibly. Uh, <laughs> no, no. Tim, Tim has spoken beautifully. And, and, and of, course, of course, one might have uh, included uh, the story of Joseph. And, and uh, you, see, you see two things in Joseph, uh, uh, the realist and the dreamer uh, combined. Uh, I, I think that's partly what we're all here about is is, is how to connect uh, uh, the, the realist and the dreamer within ourselves. Uh, uh, Joseph, Joseph is the man who can find a meaning in a dream and, uh, and knows how to turn that meaning into policy. And, uh, and then uh, Joseph is the man who, uh, uh, I, I, wonder, I wanna come back to a point I made about the, the moral valence because Joseph, Joseph might have taken the opportunity. He had dreamed of his brothers, all his family bowing down to him. He might have taken the opportunity to do the man. Uh, he certainly had the power. Uh, 
he he demonstrated that power to them and to himself more than once uh, in in uh, when when he was uh, almost cruelly playing with them, uh, and yet uh, uh, the the moral he found in them, and and I think it's important to notice that 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 moment occurs at a turning point when 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 he wept and and he realized what he had to do. Uh, he might not have known until that point. So the moment of choice that I was focusing on in the case of Esther uh, recurs in the case of, of uh, Joseph. Uh, I was talking uh, uh, just yesterday about, um, about David and Jonathan when the coded message is sent. And on one level, it, it means it means to the, to the boy sent to get to the arrows, it means uh, whether or not he should get the arrows. And, and to uh, David and Jonathan, in the first instance, it means um, uh, you're safe or you're not safe. The, the code is very clear. But then when the two men stand face to face, and I think we owe it to Levinas to look back at that idea of the face, when the two men stand face to face with one another, and it suddenly comes to David in its full emotional impact what Jonathan has done by saving his life he has given up his kingdom and then the two men weep on each other's shoulders and David uh, uh, recognizes what has happened and he wept more than Jonathan uh, that that turning point where where Joseph decides if you will uh, uh, to accept uh, his brother's recurrence in his life as an act of providence and his being sold into slavery as an act of providence, not according to their intentions, he's not justifying what they did, uh, but according to God's higher plan. Uh, my thesis in this paper was that, that God's higher plan is something in which we take part uh, and nature in general takes part, but we, we as the active and conscious agencies <laughs> <laughs> we take part in a very special way, and, and, and uh, we're called upon uh, to recognize that kind of responsibility. Uh, that's part of what providence and divine action uh, ought to mean. Thank you very much. We have about 20 minutes for questions. Right there for uh, Professor Swinburne. Um, start? Oh, if you could wait, please, for the mic. <laughs> We'd appreciate that. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Um, you believe in human free will. I like to think the Hebrew Bible does as well. I believe in human free will. Uh, I believe in human divine interaction, and I think the Hebrew Bible does. I have some doubt whether you do. Um, interaction with somebody means they do something, and you respond in a w one way if they do one thing, and something in another way if they do a different thing. Now, I think the pi picture we get of God in the Hebrew Bible and, uh, is uh, first, for example, Israel sins, or individual Israel sins, then God is angry, then the Israelite says he's sorry, then God says he forgives him. Now, this implies that God does something that he wouldn't have done had we not acted freely. And uh, that implies that a whole thing hasn't been arranged in advance. Now, your picture of it is the whole thing has been arranged in advance. Um, it's all been planned from the beginning. And I don't think that gives a very nice picture of God. Um, and uh, in our sort of in our religious life, uh, we like to think we can interact with God in this way, and a petitionary prayer would be a meaningless activity on the way you have described it, because God's already prepared his uh, reaction. Now, that would make sense if we didn't have free will, but if we do, I just don't think that's an interactive God, and I don't think it's a very attractive picture of God corresponding to the Hebrew Bible. Thank you. Um, I was expecting much worse from you. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, uh, 
Uh, on, uh, on, on charge one, I have to plead not guilty. I'm not advocating some form of predestination. Uh, on the contrary, I'm saying that God sets up situations in which we have to act. Um, those situations, otherwise known as life or nature or history, uh, call it what you like, uh, I believe uh, in an open future, not, uh, not in a, a preordained uh, future. So, uh, so I have to plead not guilty to denying uh, human freedom. Um, as far as um, uh, God's uh, mutability or God's uh, anger, uh, wrath, uh, you know, uh, I, I'm a great lover of traditional translations of, of, the, uh, of the Bible. Uh, I'm a great lover of Tyndale as well as the King James Version. And um, I have to say uh, that sometimes uh, those translations most familiar to us are a little euphemistic. Um, we, don't, we don't try literally to translate the poetic usage of Vayichara Po. Um, if you really want to translate literally and to take the Bible literally, it doesn't say that God was wroth. It says that God's nose was on fire. Uh, I don't think that God has a nose, and I don't think it's capable of being on fire. And I, and, and I, think, that, uh, I think that the idea that God uh, gets angry is a, um, a possibly a, a projection or, more appropriately, a poetic usage about what is uh, unacceptable to God. Certainly, human beings do lots of things that are unacceptable to God, and are our, our goal, and I think what we try and state in our petitionary prayers, is that our actions and intentions uh, should be acceptable to God. As we say, I don't know, may, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable before thee, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. We also don't believe that God is literally a rock. Um, the, the, uh, the idea, the idea that I am advocating uh, is that um, uh, much of what we identify uh, as uh, sin, uh, as wrongdoing, as evil in God's eyes, as unacceptable to God, um, is, um, is actions which fall away from the norms and aspirations that God sets before us. Uh, that's, that, we've, we've got a mission, all us human beings and Israel uh, in particular, have a mission uh, to live up to the possibilities of being holy as God is holy, as it says in Leviticus 19.2. Uh, when, we, when we fail in that way, when we, when we, when we violate uh, that, that mission, um, uh, that can metaphorically be, be termed God's anger, if one, one wants to put it that way. Um, but if you look at the book of Judges, you see a very, very interesting thing. Um, uh, and it's a good example of what I was speaking of when I spoke of the, the, uh, the parallelism, if you will, of, uh, of the natural with the divine action. That is, uh, when Israel violate the covenant, in the book of Judges, they are repeatedly uh, subject to depredations and, and uh, terrible events. Um, the Bible scholars tell us that when it says v'tzaku, they, they cried out to God, this was an organized um, penitential event in which people came together and rededicated themselves to God's uh, plan. Coming together uh, gave them both the moral and the military force to overcome the enemies who took advantage of them when they fell away from that plan. Uh, I, see, I see a duality there, uh, which um, I don't uh, by any means wish to diminish or reduce the divine end of that, but I also don't want to eliminate uh, the human end of it as well. As for petitionary prayer, uh, I, I think it's terribly, terribly important uh, for us to view that prayer aspirationally uh, as uh, Sudha Dionysius does uh, and, uh, and not to view it uh, in terms of, of some kind of a bargain, some kind of a deal uh, like the one uh, that Tim was mentioning from, uh, that Kipling makes fun of or for that matter that, uh, that Plato 
uh, makes fun of in the Uthafro. Okay, we have quite a few questions, one down here in the front, the woman in the purple. <clears throat> Hi, here's Lenny. You were talking about you, fasting. Uh, fasting as a form of petitioning the Lord. And that's something that's very little talked about in our Christian tradition. Um, comments, please. About fasting? Well, Esther and her attendants fasted. After? Esther, Esther. And yes, her yes, of course. Um, there's an interesting take on fasting, and uh, uh, it's, it, it is uh, related to a petition uh, to the Lord, but in the rabbinic context, fasting is typically regarded as penitential. Uh, that is, the effort is one of uh, purifying ourselves, and that was how I interpreted it when I referred to the fast that Esther called upon her people. Not, not we're abasing ourselves before you, Lord, therefore you better do what we're asking you to do, but um, we are um, humbling ourselves uh, before our Lord uh, in the hopes that we will be worthy of um, some form of, shall we say, salvation. That, that, uh, that we're, asking, we're asking for an act of grace. And in doing so, we want to come before God with clean hands, as it says in the Psalms, right? Who, who shall enter the house of the Lord, etc., right? Niki kapayamu bar levav, he who is uh, pure of hands and clear of heart, right? And, and if, we, if we perhaps are not as clean of hands, and uh, you've got a whole nation here, right? In joining in this fast, uh, let them purify themselves, express penitential actions so that they could be worthy to make the, such a request. Tim, do you want to add anything to that? Or? Uh, I'd, I'd be gilding lilies to add, add anything to what Lana's okay. just said. Let's move All on. All right. Well, good. We have a lot of questions. Maybe uh, in the back there, just to spread it around a little bit, the, I'm sorry, the maroon shirt. <laughs> I don't know the names. Yes, please. Thank you. Thank you. Um, when uh, Sarah and Abraham entertain God, unaware that he's God, uh, then he promises Sarah that she will bear a child. And her first reaction is to fall on the ground laughing because she's way past menopause. Um, in your talk, it's, you seem to want to say, well, God works in coordination with nature, so we have complementary explanations. But in that, in that instance, isn't Sarah saying something like, this is not going to happen naturally. This is going to happen only if you intervene. It will fulfill a promise that you've made, but it requires something more than nature. I, I, think I wonder that, if you'd comment on that. Please, yes. I, I think that everything in nature requires something more than nature. That was the main thesis of my talk, and I don't want the, uh, the, the qualifying side of what I was saying to uh, eclipse the, uh, the positive side of what I'm saying. I think that everything in nature uh, requires more than is nature. We have to look at nature in a non-reductionistic way. As far as that particular event, I wasn't there and I am not prepared to sign on to the literal truth of the chronologies in the book of Genesis, some of which are much more extensive than, uh, than, than the mere 120 years of Moses. Uh, what, uh, what, I will, what I will say, um, is that uh, we all know that there's, a, uh, there's such a thing as a menopausal baby. Uh, and um, there are plenty of examples of um, uh, women who are infertile who then bear a child. It's, it's generalized in the Psalms. Uh, uh, Moshevi Akera Tabayit Eim HaBaniv Semecha, the, the, the uh, the woman, the woman who was barren uh, is now a happy mother of children. Uh, uh, how does that happen? Uh, uh, do we ascribe it to God? I think the important thing when it happens to Hannah or when it happens at the birth of Samson or when it happens 
uh, the birth of Samuel. Um, these are portentous events. Uh, what, we're ha what we're seeing here is a recognition of the importance of this particular child that's going to be born, not of the rarity of that particular event, uh, which, isn't, which isn't all that, that rare. Um, in, um, you know, I, I taught for many years in, in uh, Hawaii, and uh, if you know anything about uh, pineapple culture, uh, pineapples, after they're harvested, um, uh, sometimes sprout a little extra pineapple, which is called a ratoon crop. And the ratoon crop is um, uh, smaller and sweeter than the original pineapple. And uh, mothers in Hawaii who have born a menopausal baby refer to those children as their ratoon crop. Um, and they do so, by the way, in laughter. And it doesn't mean in their very, very pro pronatalist culture uh, that they are abusing or being cynical about what has happened to them. They, too, consider it miraculous. And uh, I think uh, their acceptance and their joy in that new birth uh, is part of what makes it a miracle. Okay. Other questions? Maybe right, right next. Yeah, man in the white, and then we'll move on down. Right. Thank you. Uh, we have about time for two questions. This one's short. Uh, Joe Hubick from K11. Um, you spoke a lot about the presence of God in existence as a kind of saturation, although I don't think you used that word uh, in particular. But my question is, if the presence of God is so saturated in all of existence um, that when God is conceptually removed from how we understand existence, nothing changes, I'm curious what kind of status does the presence of God have? And I, and I don't mean this in a, as, a, as a critical question. I, I really would like to know. I, I appreciate the question deeply and, and for the reason that the previous speaker said. Uh, I've never heard a speaker say what he said before. Uh, I must have spoken very badly. Uh, if, if, uh, if you thought that I thought that uh, removal of God from the universe would make no difference. Uh, it's not something I said, but if it's something that you gathered from what I said, I spoke very poorly. Um, the, the, uh, uh, the removal of God from the universe would be the elimination of everything. What we have to appreciate in nature as the work of God is the existence of anything, the conatus of anything, the tendency of matter to stay matter and to keep moving, and uh, the fact that absolute zero <laughs> can't be reached, uh, uh, and all the way up the whole hierarchy uh, to, the, to the emergence of life and mind and whatever there may be beyond life and mind. All of that is God. Uh, I guess that's... There's, there's a wonderful passage in Plotinus where he says, um, uh, you know, he, he, he gets asked apparently by a student, uh, if, if there were no, no God, um, would the world still exist? And, and uh, you expect him to say no, as I just said. And Plotinus, Plotinus says, oh yes, the world would still exist because it's too beautiful not to exist. But you know, the people who conceptually remove God from nature are missing that beauty or denying it, okay? The removal of God from nature is a logical possibility, perhaps, especially if you bracket the word God and don't take it in its full intention, but it's not a real possibility at all. One very brief question back there in the back. Thank you, I'll try and keep it brief. brief. Mustafa Kara Ali Harvard. Now, I wanna follow up on, on this issue of the miracle and the menopausal birth that you, you speak about that is not actually a rarity, but it, it's just an invitation to marvel. Well, then, then in history, chronologically, was the virgin birth of Jesus. And that is by no means a menopausal birth, but rather it, it has to be a miracle because it is a rare event. We, we don't know of any other case whereby a man is born of, of no father. I'm, I'm, I mean, this is the Islamic perspective of Jesus being born of no father, but of Mary. So I then want to touch, I, I, I then want to link okay. that to the occasionalism comment that you passed on Islamic Kalam, where you said 
they actually did not believe in, in, um, uh, in causality. And I didn't say that. I the, said they did not believe in natural causality. Natural causality. Then, historically speaking, and don't want to get into too much detail, but historically speaking, the, the Asharites that you referred to, the, the Asharites, in fact, carried a model for science that I'm speaking about on Wednesday, but it comes to fruition with Islamic astronomy in the 14th century in relation to Copernicus. So the issue here, which is crucial to natural causation, is that it associates itself with a constructivist perspective on knowledge and epistemology. So, I mean, we shouldn't rush to conclusions that occasionalism, as Maimonides deemed, was, was a closure on, on, on science. Thanks. Very um, brief, I'm sorry, but just uh, I'll, a brief I'll try. Response. I'll try to be real quick. Um, I contrasted al Ashari with uh, the uh, occasionalist Kalam, which he criticized himself and rejected their atomism, as you know. Um, the, um, the Asherites uh, uh, did attempt to accept uh, causality in a certain sense. Uh, they allowed capacities in things, although you must remember that the capacities in things are created at the instant by God. Uh, they do not have other possibilities of being exercised, and they do not exist before the very moment of their realization. We can talk about that later if you like. Um, I would not associate the Copernican Revolution with Asherite uh, theory, uh, although um, uh, uh, Maimonides follows al Ghazali in believing that if God wants to create a miracle, he changes the nature of things rather than acting against their nature. Um, the, uh, the point about uh, uh, the, uh, the virgin birth, I have to leave that to my Christian colleagues. Uh, but I am surprised that, I'm surprised that, uh, and I'd love to hear what you say about, uh, you know, God neither begotten nor was begotten, uh, which is Quranic, of course. Uh, that, uh, that's not an Islamic doctrine that's uh, familiar to me, the acceptance of the virgin birth. Um, but, uh, but, but I'm sure we'll have lots of interesting uh, things said about that question by my Christian colleagues in the course of the conference. Thank you so much. Let's give a hand.